Hey, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Making Things Happen, the podcast with me, your host, Steve Sims. We've got Lisa Forbes on the podcast today. She spent 14 years in a maximum security prison. And that's a hook for you to kind of like go, oh, really? Why? But she talks about prison being at home. Prison is anywhere where you can't be yourself. And she talks about the trauma that goes on within the prison of your own mind. And today, your mind can't take and comprehend a lot of the stress that is forced on from just life today. This lady decided to have the pain that she went through to be a benefit to other people. I love chatting with her. I didn't really know her before this show, but it intrigued me with the approach that I got. And I was very thrilled to have her on the show. Listen to how she talks about it, how she frames it, how she talks about the identity as you and not what you did or do. That's a big big PowerPoint in today's world, especially when we look at social and we go, oh, I wish our life was as good as X. Own your identity and gain that confidence. Enjoy the show and listen to Lisa. Hey, Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. How are you? So look, full full uh, transparency to everyone. A lot of the people I know that I bring onto the show, that friends, you know, we work together. Me and you, we're new buddies. We've never met, never had a conversation. And I probably get about 200 people per week going, hey, I should be on your show. But you were, I don't want to say you were interesting because that makes the other 199 seem though they weren't. But a lot of those weren't. I'm going to read your bio, which I don't do a lot. And it says, Lisa was raised on the south side of Chicago, where she experienced a harrowing childhood that ultimately led to an emotional breakdown, a violent crime, and to her spending 14 years in a maximum security prison. That's one hell of an intro. Mm -hmm. Now, we can fast forward. You're a motivational speaker. You're a coach. You've got a book out. I can take it from here. We're going to be talking about that. But you turned your life around. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people know that I am a great supporter and a great fan of Defy Ventures. I take entrepreneurs into uh, uh, max um, security prisons three times a year. I'm a great believer in second chances. But it's not a very accommodating environment for you to suddenly go, hey, I'm going to change my life. How do you manage to stay positive in a very dark arena? Well, you know, I was telling someone else recently that people ask me this question a lot. And I realized that over the years, how I feel like I got to that point changed. But really what it was is this. After I got out, I was work standing um, at the train stop waiting to go home from work. And this man who appeared to be homeless was digging in the trash and mumbling to himself. And I happened to be standing close enough to him to hear what he was saying, Steve. And what he was saying was, people are looking at me. I wasn't always like this. I just came upon hard times. And I was thunderstruck because I realized that was the key to what helped me stay positive. Just like even while he was digging in a garbage can looking for something to eat, he was able to separate what he was experiencing from who he was. I realized that was the key. That is what I had always done. I had always had a sense, even while I was going through what I was going through, this is not who I am. And so now I realize what helped me stay positive was something in me separated my identity from my experiences. Was that, was, an aha, was that an aha moment? Was it something that was sudden? Because you, you, there must have been, and as I say, I've been in, in the environments. I go to Tehachapi and I go to Kern, which are both uh, level four maximum security prisons. And these are dark places where nine times out of ten, you're focused on your environment, staying mm-hmm. safe, mm-hmm. following the rules, not mm-hmm. trying to kind of make bad eye contact. Mm-hmm. There's so much focus that you lose focus on yourself. Exactly. So how did it work for you? 
somehow I was able to just something in me kept saying, I know this is not who I am. And at the time, I really couldn't identify what the difference was. But I to, I realized that identity was everything. And if, if I knew that what someone else was telling me I was, was not what I was, then I had a chance to become what I was. But if I began to accept what other people identified me as, then hope was lost. So oh. I held on to the to the idea that I know I can be something other than what they're telling me. This is not who I am. And, and identity is everything. That is what I try to get people to hang on to now. I don't want you to tell me what you what has happened to you, what someone else has called you. I want you to tell me who you think you are. Are we losing that today? Because there was a very powerful moment in that conversation. You were saying that, you know, if you accept who other people think you are, then you become lost and you become basically a puppet to their imagination. Mm -hmm. So isn't that a problem we've got today in society? We have it everywhere. We have it in everywhere from no matter what you what uh, ism you look at, if it's racism or sexism or whatever it is, it really comes down to someone else telling you who you are, someone else telling you who, what your limits are, what you can be. That's not really the problem. The problem is, are you answering to what they're calling you? Are you accepting that identity and then living into it? And if I can get people to realize that you are living into a story that somebody else wrote, it's time for you to write your own story and for you to identify yourself in that story. Then from there, we're home free. I can get you to where you want to go. Oh, I love that. I love that. I want to hang out with you more. I love <laughs> the fact that you said, and I've heard it many times before, you're not what you've done. And it, it, I, I think a lot of people hang on to that, and we hang on to it even in a in a, in a really tiny moment. Like when you're in a when you're in a networking party, which is my definition of hell. I hate networking parties, <laughs> but you get people give you that credit uh, that business card. I wish they gave you a credit card, but they give you the business card, and they say, "Hey, you know who are you? I'm the chairman of. You're actually you're the identity of what you do." Mm -hmm. And you're talking about there's a differentiator before between who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. And especially in the situation of some of the incarcerated, what you did is not who you are. There's a differentiator. And you've been able to split that. But today we tend to have our identity very much anchored on what it is we do. And that's a crutch of insecurity, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So and how do you get people to change that? Well, you know, not knowing who you are is actually a form of trauma. Because usually when people are growing up, they are given the skills and the tools and the opportunities to figure out who they are. But a lot of people have grown up being told you're nothing. You know, you're this, you're that, you're, you're all kinds of labels, you're all kinds of things that are this small. And so when that becomes the only thing you know, because that's what you grew up with, what we have is people who just have never even asked the question, who do I say I am? Before... People who have come out of prison, that's why the term I use is restored citizens. And for me, that term is very special because a lot of people use the term returning citizens, and I get that. But in the 14 years of my incarceration, I saw people returning to society and returning right back to prison. So the, the term returning makes me think of a, a term cycle. I use the word restored citizens because what I want people to think of is what you would have been had you not experienced that trauma. What you would have been had you not been, had your personality not been warped by all that pain. And actually I got that sense from, I was reading the Bible as many people do when they're incarcerated. And there's a scripture in the Bible that says, God will restore to you the years that the locust and the caterpillar and the canker worm devoured. And when I saw that, I said, I want that. I want to, my life restored. I want those years restored to me. I want my sanity restored to me. I know it's still in there. It hasn't been, it's been overlaid by all this stuff. 
But the, the crux of who I am is still in there. And just like you restore a painting to its original glory, that's what I wanted to be, Steve. I wanted to be that painting that had been covered up with a bunch of gunk, but let it be restored to what it originally was. So I call people like myself restored citizens because I want people to see that you have, you are a masterpiece who has been covered up with a bunch of gunk. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> I want to get around the mindset and then I want to get into your journey and I want to get into where you are now. So let's get into something that's, that's pretty argumentative only so that we can validate it. Mm -hmm. We want to pigeonhole people today. We, we feel uncomfortable if we can't pocket you somehow. Mm -hmm. So again, it's us enforcing our notion, our ideal of what you are on you. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked with a number from Defy that have that have, have been through situations. Um, some of them have their, not their own doing, but they've been caught up in the cycle of, of, of crime. And now they've had to pay for it and they've come back out. But they're continually and eternally boxed as a felon Mm -hmm. And as, let's be blunt, a second-class citizen. Exactly. And I will openly say I've had some of the most real, vulnerable conversations in a group where people have wanted to discard these individuals. And then two weeks later, I've been in a Hollywood party where I wouldn't trust anyone with my phone number. <laughs> So it's a really, and my son, Henry Sims, he's 24 years old now, and I think he's been going to prison with me for like three years. Mm -hmm. And he just really enjoys the ability to be able to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. But with everyone being pigeonholed as a felon and wanting to turn around and go, hey, Lisa, that sounds great, but you're in that pocket. You mm -hmm. know, I, don't, I can't trust. How do you handle, how do you handle it with them? And does it ever create anything for you or are you strong enough now that you're able to go, well, that's actually what I did, not who I am? Well, I handle it with them with, as you said, conversation. I believe that, you know, a lot of it, Steve, the, a lot of the reasons we pigeonhole people is just plain old mental laziness. You know, and in a way, that's kind of the way the mind works. I mean, we don't have to think every morning about how to tie our shoes, right, or how to brush our teeth. We, it's easier for the brain to come up with these labels and say, I know what that is. And so, you know, and also things like Twitter and, 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 and social media doesn't really lend itself to thoughtful conversation. So a lot of people have really gotten used to give me the 30-second version of who you are. Nobody is that shallow. Everybody, everybody has a story, right? And so, like you said, even the people who, you know, haven't been incarcerated, that doesn't mean they haven't committed a crime, right? I keep telling people that, you know, we're, you're dealing with the people who've been caught, not the ones who have done something. <laughs> and in fact, you know, in the book, I talk about how even the distinction between nonviolent offender and violent criminal. It's really false because there are a lot of people who are incarcerated for a nonviolent offense just because that's the one they got caught for, but they are violent people. They have done violent things for which they've never been caught. Meanwhile, you can have someone like myself self, who committed a violent offense in the midst of an emotional breakdown, where if you have all the context, you can see why that happened. And yet I'm a person who, when I watched Michael Jackson's uh, video thriller. I had nightmares for days, right? I am not a violent person. So the distinction is false. So it, it really is something that requires more conversation, more thoughtful um, conversation between people about who people really are. And I think the time is right for that. If you look at the numbers of people in, in the United States and in the world who are either incarcerated or have been, and then come and look at their families, there's hardly anybody untouched by somebody who's been incarcerated for something. And so I think that the, the time is ripening uh, for people to understand, we need to take a closer look at who is incarcerated and why, and what's the best way we can bring these people out so they can be restored to their lives. Wow. So 
you you came out, and I think we said at the beginning it was 14 years that you were incarcerated, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. You came out, you decided that was what I did, not who I am. You mm -hmm. had that mindset. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be restored. You could have gone about your life. You could have slid into society, made your own way, and gone, okay, I've been given a second chance now because of me, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do something with it. But you decided to actually stand up and go, hang on, I've got something to teach. I've got something to say. Now, of course, look, haters are going to hate every five seconds. A friend of mine once said, be so successful, you've got haters. <laughs> I guarantee that within your posts, within your feeds, within your, within your book, there are people that are just looking for a reason to throw hate at you. Mm -hmm. So actually standing up from the environment that you were in to actually saying something for other people, that shows a strength of character. But why did you decide, hey, I've got something that I can say that someone needs to hear? Why did you want to put yourself up there for that? Well, two reasons. The first was personal. I really wanted my pain to count for something. You know, oh. I wanted to have gone through this for a reason and, and to make sure that I felt like I had brought something out of it and wasn't just a victim of it. And so for me, that meant owning my story, not living in the shadows, not worried about, you know, I don't want people to find out. This is who I am. This is what I've done. I know why. And I really feel like most people should be so lucky. So I really wanted to own that part of it. And then the second part of it, Steve, was just that as I began to see so many people who hadn't had the benefit of being able to do what I have been able to do, one of the things that really saved me was literacy. Most people in, who are in prison cannot read above a sixth grade level. And so even if it's 14, 20 years, however long they're in there, the majority of it is spent watching television, playing cards, doing things that do not provide them with any redemption. Because I was able to read, I was able to re-educate myself, to extend really my life, the boundaries of my life beyond those four walls. And so that gave me compassion for why other people may have the equal uh, desire and ability to change, but don't have the resources. And I, so I wanted to share that. It was really empathy. When I look, anytime I look at somebody else, I mean, I share the story of my trauma because I want people to know that when I say their lives can be restored from trauma, I'm not speaking from theory. I'm speaking from what I lived. And I was a severely traumatized child and teenager. And so I know what I, that when I say what I've done works, it works. So I wanted people to be able to understand that when they want to tell me their story, they, they're talking to somebody who can understand it. And when I see anybody, I've been homeless, you know, I've been incarcerated, I've been, you name it, I've been it. That's why I tell the story. I, I see myself. I never see other. When I walk past people on the street and they're muttering to themselves, I see myself. I don't see crazy people. I see minds under so much stress that they're breaking. We're under more stress than our minds were meant to thrive under. And so it's just the compassion to know that if I have something that can help people, I don't think it was given to me for me to keep it to myself. Oh, oh I like that. Mic drop. What's the name of the book? I can take it from here. I love that title. Where it's can a, they find it? You can buy it anywhere. It's on Amazon. It's at local stores. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's on Goodreads. It's it's widely available. You can get it audio, ebook, or the print copy. Did you read the audio? I did not read the audio. No, I had someone read the audio, and, and people have said, "Oh, you you know your voice. You should have read the audio." Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I I I really wanted I wanted to tell my story because you know many much of what I was going through at the time I was going through it I felt so alone. I felt like surely nobody else is is going through this only to find out that everybody is going through something. And trauma is trauma. I first started telling the story of my trauma about incarceration. And then people started writing me and telling me their stories about being imprisoned in a bad marriage. Mm. 
You know, mm. people's hope, some people are in prison behind their front door. There's all kinds of trauma. So I began to realize that trauma is trauma and people could relate to my story, even if they've never been incarcerated. I wanted to show them how they could be free from trauma and be free from it permanently. Not just not put a Band-Aid on it and pretend that you're all right. Put all these wonderful pictures up on Facebook and then behind the scenes, you're really suicidal. I don't want you to be that way. I want you to be really well for real. And having found the tools to do that, that helped someone who was as traumatized as me, I felt obligated to share it with other people. Wow. How, I don't know if the word is traumatic. I don't know if it's nerves, but what was it like the first time that someone actually said, Hey, speak on my stage about your journey. What was that moment like? Was it, were you were you scared? Were you excited? Was it therapeutic? Was it uh, revealing? What was your emotions when you were first asked, hey, we want your, your pain to be, as you say, your pain to be stand for something? Mm -hmm. You know, what was that like the first time you actually went out to give your story? You know, there is an element of therapy to it. It's therapeutic to um, own your story and to own mm. yourself and to you know there's there's is a certain sense of power in being able to just say this is who i am and i'm comfortable with that you know and i don't really feel like i need to uh, go through the rest of my life in the shadows or apologizing for it what i what i have to do is to go forward and be the best person that i can be from that point forward and so it's there's a certain power in saying i don't i don't have to um be on my knees, you know, for the rest of my life because of the past. Um, it, but then also, yeah, it's it's exciting. I like I always um, do like questions and answers, and I'm always struck at the questions people have, you know, and the ways that I can see th that they're working it they're they're working my story into their own lives, you know. It, it, there's a sense of, of of commonality, the human experience. We're not as separated as we think we are, even though our experiences may look different. If, if you're traumatized on the inside and I'm traumatized on the outside, you know, that, that humanity is our, is where we can link up. What's the next steps for you, Lisa? You know, you've come out, you're like a, a rocket ship. Now you own you, which I absolutely love. <laughs> uh, you've got your stance, your story, your belief, your power, and there's no apologies, nor should there ever need to be any. You've got the book. When did the book come out, by the way? Came out in June. Oh, all right, so it's recent. Okay, so that's great. How's it mm -hmm. doing, by the way? Is it selling it's nicely? Doing, it's doing well, yeah. And I had a, uh, I was actually covered on C-SPAN Book TV, which okay. was which was really exciting. So I'm I'm really pleased that people are uh, relating to the story. All right, I'm going to ask everyone that's listening to this, if you grab Lisa's book, do me a favor. As an author, I know this is powerful as well. Throw a review up for Lisa. You know, read the book and just give a little bit of love back. In fact, even if you hate it, and I know this is probably not the best thing you want to hear, but even if you hate Lisa's book, put it up there. You know, a review is a review and it'll mm -hmm. feed to somebody. So, okay, that's great. So the book's out there. It's selling well. We've just heard they want to do a review. You speak. But what's the next chapter looking like for Lisa? Well, I'm working with a, a group of federal judges across the country. We want to do pilot programs to introduce trauma resolution to, to uh, prisoners as well as those who, who are um, on parole or recently got out of prison. And so there is a, uh, a man who uh, did a video, but not a, a video, but a, he, he, there's a DVD called Operation um, emotional freedom, the answer. And it was a five day pilot program that was done on traumatized combat veterans using the emotional freedom technique or tapping, some people call it. And, and over a five day uh, program, they filmed working with these veterans, tapping through their trauma, bringing their levels of trauma down, and then followed them over a two year period after that to demonstrate that the, the results had lasted. They had not, uh, the, the trauma had not gone back up, their relationships were intact, and they were doing well. These were combat veterans. And so I contacted the guy who did the DVD, Eric Curie, and said, You know, Eric, 
I love your DVD, but and, and the five day program is great. But a, there are no black people in it, and b, would you be interested in doing it for people whose trauma is related to prison rather than to uh, having been in the military? He was all on board for it. We were ready to go, and then he died. Oh. And so the rug was snatched right out from under me, but we're, we're, we're going forward with it, again, with some uh, judges and other uh, interested parties. And if anybody listening wants to even be a participant or wants to know more about it, they can email me, Lisa, at lisaforbespeaks.com. Um, so the next step, that is the next step, to get pilot programs. Uh, we want to go nationally, but we have to start somewhere. Uh, to actually teach people tapping because that's the technique that I used on myself. And what was so special about it, Steve, was that when I learned tapping, I was sitting in a house that was in foreclosure. I was unemployed and my husband had just walked out on me. And so I realized that if I had had to have therapy where I had to get up and go somewhere. I had to have money. I had to have health insurance. I had to have transportation. I never would have gotten it. Tapping was something that I was able to teach myself and set myself free emotionally. So it's very important to me to bring tapping to people who were in the same situation as I am. People who you, you could be sitting in a cell and learn tapping. You could be sitting on the sidewalk and learn tapping. We want to bring it to people because it's a way to bring your trauma down and to set yourself emotionally free. So you've identified the fact that this is going to this is going to be offered to those incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But you've also defined that incarceration in, isn't necessarily in four walls. It could be in your own home. Exactly right. I do and, like and, that. And people who have uh, like heard me on other programs have responded saying, you know, the number of uh, firefighters who are traumatized, EMTs, police officers, anybody on the you know front line of anything, this really can apply to anybody who's, who realizes that their daily life consists of being in a state of heightened uh, awareness or fear of trauma or you know the military or anything. We all have lots of uh, various ways that we're traumatized. So it's not limited to people who are incarcerated. It's, it's for people who need to be emotionally free from whatever trauma they're experiencing. So we're going to be bringing, we want to bring that to people. We want people to uh, register and sign up if they want to be a part of it. And then we want to also do some online summits just to teach people easy ways that they can uh, resolve their own trauma and get to the point where they can set themselves free to make some different decisions. And where do they sign up? They can email me at lisa at lisaforbespeaks.com. They can go to my website. They can contact me on it, lisaforbespeaks.com. Just uh, contact me and let me know you're interested. And we're, we're uh, registering people across the country as we get started in 2023. Lisa, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Uh, LisaForbesSpeaks.com is her mm -hmm. website. The show notes will be underneath this video, so you can look out if you weren't able to write it down, if you were driving on the Peloton or whatever, you're going to be able to kind of look below and see the, the website that you can reach out to her. Again, give another final shout out for your book. <laughs> I can take it from here. It's not just a book title. It is it is my personal statement for myself that I can take it from here. And it's my vision for everybody who reads the book that by the end of that book, you will feel like you can take it from here. Don't mess with Lisa. She's on your side. Lisa, thank you very much for being part of this program. Thank you very much for being willing to stand up and actually share your story, your pain, and owning it for the benefit of others. Lisa, thank you very much for being on the, being my, on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Steve. I appreciate it. Bye for now. Hey, I hope you liked that episode of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast. And remember, these are done for you. If you like them, subscribe, share them around. But if you don't like them... Send me an email to ask at stevedsims.com and you can tell me what I need to do to make this the most dynamic podcast you listen to. Anyway, make sure whatever you learned from the last podcast, you actually do something with. Without action, it's just a bunch of people blowing air. Have a good time. Until next time. Bye.